we need to spend a few minutes, hopefully not too long. End of this is Half Blood Prince. Um, chapter twenty nine, the Phoenix Lament. Page 615, I think we briefly talked about this on Monday at the very end. Notice we see, after Harry says, Snape killed Dumbledore, McGonagall. We all wondered, we trust, you know, he trusted, holy Snape, I can't believe it. And then McGonagall again speaks. He had an ironclad reason. And then we hear Lupin speak in... A variety of others. Notice how quickly they accept what Harry says. It, it's almost like we knew. We knew secretly, you know, Snape had to be bad, etc., etc. Okay? We find out others tried to stop Snape. Snape said, I had to go and help, you know, the, had to go stop Death Eaters, etc. So I want to pick up with skipping, you know, Tonks and Lupin expressing their love for each other and such. Um, page 627. <coughs> Slughorn mentions, you know, that he thought he taught Snape. He thought he knew him. And by the way, what was Slughorn previously when he was at Hogwarts? Head of, head of Slytherin, okay? Um, and McGonagall speaks, Slughorn speaks, and then Sprout speaks. Now, how often in the course of the novels, we're almost at the seventh novel, how often do we really see um, Professor Sprout? Very little. We see her in, you know, the second book because she's raising mandrakes, which are plot device. They're solely there so that, you know, somebody can be in Frozen, you know, at the end of the novel. Um, she's alluded to in the fourth book, you know, because of Dilly Weed and all that kind of stuff in, in Neville. We don't actually see her very often. I mean, She's described as being up at the high table, you know, at meals. But other than that, you know, she's she's not that important in terms of overall characters. And so they're discussing what do they do about Hogwarts? <coughs> does Hogwarts stay open or does Hogwarts close? I mean, they've just lost the headmaster. Well, who could, obviously, immediately step into Dumbledore's shoes? McGonagall, she's done it before, okay? Sprout says on page 627, in response to McGonagall saying, I want to talk about what happens to Hogwarts before he, meaning the Minister of Magic, gets here. Personally, I'm not convinced that the school should reopen next year. The death of the headmaster at the hands of one of our colleagues is a terrible stain upon Hogwarts history. It is horrible. You know, it's like, this is grounds to close it, tear it down, see, you know, so salt in the ground, obliterate. Hufflepuff. Sprout. I am sure Dumbledore would have wanted the school to remain open. I feel that if a single pupil wants to come, then the school ought to remain open for that pupil. Go back to the Sorting Hat song, book five. What did Hufflepuff say? I'll teach the lot, she says. But she also does say, give me the rest. You guys pick what you want, and I'll take the rest. Here, in the person of Sprout, who's head of Hufflepuff, notice we hear Hufflepuff House essentially say, even if one student wants to go back. The whole edifice should remain open. OK? 
Okay? I just find that kind of interesting because Hufflepuff is the one saying it's not all about Dumbledore. Because that's kind of McGonagall's thing. It is. It's about Dumbledore and Snape. I mean, head teachers fighting back. Hufflepuff is the one who says what? It's about the students. The whole reason for Hogwarts is the students. Okay? So, they keep talking. Hagrid says, next page, I'm staying. <laughs> Even if you don't allow kids in, I'm staying. He's still going to what? He's going to maintain the grounds. He's going to hold the keys. He's going to keep the castle open and such. All right? So, um, the white tomb. And around 637, 38, probably around 639, Paragraph that begins over at the Slytherin table, Crab and Goyle were muttering together, hulking boys though they were, they looked oddly lonely without the tall, pale figure of Malfoy between them. That paragraph finishes. Harry did not believe that Malfoy would have killed Dumbledore. He despised Malfoy still for his, notice, infatuation with the dark arts. How is infatuation different than love? Love should be what? Love should be long, long-lasting, long-term. Infatuation is kind of a flash in the pan. You're immediately tantalized. All right? But then what happens? It wears off. Because you start to get a little deeper into the subject or into the person, and you realize, flash, no substance. All right? Notice, Harry thinks Malfoy's infatuated. He's not a true believer. Malfoy, Malfoy, bad faith. Right? But now the tiniest drop of pity mingled with his dislike. And pity is what? Pity is an expression of what? Love. Not erotic love, not, you know, I want to be, not philia, not I want to be best friends, but compassion. Where Harry, where, Harry wondered, was Malfoy now? And what was Voldemort making him do under threat of killing him and his parents? Notice, Malfoy did what he did. Because what happened to his ability to choose otherwise? Was Malfoy under an imperious curse? No, not literally. Figuratively, metaphorically, yes he was. Because if you're holding a gun to his parents and you say, do this or they die, that's pretty much the same effect as an imperious curse. All right? Um, keep going on. This is so 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43. Somewhere around 644, 645 maybe. It finally hits him. Harry, Dumbledore is really gone. Because he sees Hagrid place the body, you know, and then the tomb appears. Without warning, it swept over him the dreadful truth more completely and undeniably than it had until now. Dumbledore was dead. Gone. Harry clutches the locket, right? Because where'd they get the locket? Back in the cave. Dumbledore drank all the water, potion, etc. But he could not prevent hot tears spilling from his eyes. He looked away from Ginny and the others stared out over the lake towards the forest as the little man in black droned on. There was movement among the trees. 
Centaurs had come to pay their respects. They did not move into the open, but Harry saw them standing quite still, half hidden in shadows, watching the wizards, their bows hanging at their sides. Harry remembered his first nightmarish trip into the forest, the first time he had ever encountered the thing that was then Voldemort. Who never made that connection. And what's going to happen? The rolling does this structure where we have one, seven, two, six, three, five, four. So you get parallels with book one, book seven, book two, book six, etc., etc. I, I never mentally noted this one. Harry first sees the Voldemort type thing, right, in the Forbidden Forest in book one, when he and Malfoy go into the forest and he sees it sucking the blood of the uh, unicorn and such. And what's going to happen toward the end of book seven? Harry's going to meet Voldemort, risen now, in the forest again, okay? And how he had faced them, and how he and Dumbledore had discussed fighting a losing battle not long thereafter. It was important, Dumbledore said, to fight and fight again and keep fighting, for only then could evil be kept at bay, though never quite eradicated. Why never quite eradicated? Think of what Gandalf says to Frodo. Okay. Or, later on, what Gandalf says in the chapter of The Last Debate. What will happen when Sauron is defeated, if Sauron is defeated? He says, a great power will be destroyed, but not evil. Why? Because it will take shape again, another time, another place. And he says, our job is to fight the evil of our day. And he tells Frodo the same thing. Okay? It's kind of like that phrase that I put up on the board. Phrase attributed to 18th century political philosopher Edmund Burke, kind of considered the father of conservatism. All it takes for evil to thrive is for good men to do nothing. We're going to hear almost that exact phrase in the seventh book. Lupin is going to say something like that to Ron when Ron doubts that, you know, people will help Voldemort and such. It was important, Dumbledore said, to fight and fight again and keep fighting. For only then could notice evil be kept at bay. In kind of control. Okay. And here's, you know, as he sits there, hearing the old guy drone on about Dumbledore and what a wonderful person he was, and he thinks about all the people who cared for him, his mother, his father, his godfather, Dumbledore, now they're all dead. He could not let anybody else stand between him and Voldemort. He must abandon forever the illusion he ought to have lost at the age of one. Do one-year-olds have illusions? No, because they don't see clearly anyways. That the shelter of a parent's arms meant that nothing could hurt him. That's the illusion. The illusion is what? Your parents can't protect you. Or your loved ones can't protect you. What's really the illusion? There's no safety here. Nothing is guaranteed. You hear all the time, that's not fair. Well, welcome to reality, Buttercup. Life's not fair. No one gives you on your birth certificate. Your life will be fair. No. C.S. Lewis, in fact, in his book, Mere Christianity, which was originally radio broadcast in the middle of the Second World War, he argues that is the very proof, the fact that people think something ought to be fair. He argues that's the proof for the existence of God. Because where do you come up? with this idea of fairness. 
it, it doesn't arise out of evolution. There's an appeal to a standard. And there is that appeal across all cultures and all times. Every one of them says it's not right to cut in front of somebody else, essentially. Okay? So, there was no waking from his nightmare, no comforting whisper in the dark that he was safe, really, that it was all in his imagination. The last and greatest of his, detect of his protectors had died, and he was more alone than he had ever been before. True or false? For those of you who've read books all one through seven, true or false, without giving anything away? It's false. That kind of implies Harry's reached bottom. Oh, the poor boy. He hasn't even come close to reaching bottom. Reaching bottom is going to happen in the next book. When he's going to lose what he thinks is everything, okay? So, we see Dumbledore's, you know, the thing come around his body and all this kind of stuff. Harry looks at Ginny, he thinks, I can't, and he tells her we can't be involved anymore. Why? Because Voldemort will come after you. So, he's going to make it known to the world. I no longer care for Ginny Weasley. And Voldemort's suddenly going to go, damn. Damn means I can't hurt her. She doesn't mean anything to him anymore. Yeah, right. And Jenny's kind of like, Harry, really? And, you know, give them the finger. Okay? So, what does Harry tell the others he's going to do? Ron and Hermione, the others. Is he going back to Hogwarts? Is he going to finish the seventh year, get his diploma, graduate, become an Auror? No. He's got a job to do, right? What is it? Find the Horcruxes. Okay? So, Scrimger comes up. Asks him some questions about Dumbledore. Asks him again, what are you talking about at Christmas? And Harry just says, Really, Stan Shumpike yet? Is Stan out of Azkaban? What is Stan Shunpike for Harry? Okay, he's innocent, but what else? Symbolically, what is he? Okay. The ministry's not only incompetence, it's immorality. It's unethical behaviors. They know Stan Shunpike is under an imperious curse. Dumbledore's man through and through, says Harry. Yep, that's right. Okay. So, that's when Harry says, I'm not coming back. Even if they open the doors, we're coming with you. Ron and Hermione tell them. Cool. So, Pick up the next book. Very briefly, well, it probably won't be very briefly. I'll probably spend 20 minutes on it. Uh, <clears throat> you have two epigraphs. Maybe I shouldn't be some marker. Two epigraphs to this poem, to this book. Okay. Epigraph beginning or before graph writing. The first one is from Aeschylus's The Libation Bearers. Aeschylus, one of the earliest Greek tragedians, writers of tragedy and drama, um, he wrote a trilogy of plays. They're collectively called the Oresteia. Okay? The first play is called Agamemnon, second one. Libation Bearers, and the third one, The Humanities. Okay? And I'm going to give you the brief, not even close notes version, it's like a version of it. Okay? So, the plays are about the ancient Greek family of Agamemnon. Agamemnon is a Greek king, king of Ithaca. 
one of the leaders, one of the generals who led the Greek forces against Troy. Okay? It was his brother, Menelaus, whose wife, Helen of Troy, okay, was kidnapped by Paris of Troy. She wasn't really kidnapped. She ran off with him. Okay? So Agamemnon helps his brother attack Troy to win his wife back. All right? But according to this play, and according to Greek myth, because the plays are based on much, much, much older Greek myth, Agamemnon and his forces couldn't set sail. They couldn't get favorable winds until he sacrificed his daughter. And he was told by the gods, we're not going to let you go until you sacrifice your daughter. I think specifically it was Poseidon who wanted this to happen. Okay? And he's like, you know, I don't really want to do this because she's my daughter. And there's a play called Iphigenia at Aulis, A-U-L-I-S, which is about her being sacrificed. But he eventually does. His wife warns him, if you kill my daughter, you know, no holds barred kind of a thing. But he does. Winds come, they go off, they fight the Trojan War for 10 years, he comes back. When he comes back, his wife, Clytemnestra, and her lover, the man he left in charge, a guy named Aegisthus, who's also his nephew, if I remember correctly. No, cousin. Um, they kill him. All right? He comes home, he walks on the red carpet, he goes into his palace, and they stab him to death. All right? Clyde of Nestor takes control, etc. His son and other surviving daughter now in this play, his son, Orestes, that's why it's called the Oresteia, and his other surviving daughter, Electra, I'm almost positive it's Electra. Um, this play begins with libations, these are offerings for the dead, being poured out at his uh, grave, okay, by Electra and some other women, and then they see Orestes, and Orestes says, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill her mother. And she's like, dude, okay. he, she killed my father. Okay. So he kills his mother. He is spurred on to do that by Apollo. Apollo says, don't worry about it. I'll make sure everything's okay. You got to do this. Okay. But just before he kills his mother in this play, she warns him, if you cut cut me. If you kill me, I will call on the Furies, which are these goddess-like beings who dwell below the earth, whose sole purpose for existence, they're actually older than the gods. Okay, they're kind of like, here's fate, here's the Furies, the gods are down here. Okay, The gods don't control either of these things. Um, their sole purpose for existence is to hunt down the guilty. Hunt them down, kill them, and torment them for all eternity. All right? I should have mentioned, you know, Agamemnon comes from a family of, well, comes from a dysfunctional family. Let's put it that way. His father, Atreus, killed his brother's children and fed them to him in a meal. And then he found out. So you know, there's some bad blood. His grandfather, named Tantalus, who is the one we get the verb to tantalize from, okay, did something also. And he, for all eternity, is stuck in a river up to his waist. And there's a bough, a tree branch hanging down full of fruit, and he can almost reach it. The bow, you know, drops down, the waves rise up, he can go, but it's always out of his reach. That's why we call something as tantalizing. You can almost touch it, right? So, there's bad blood in the family, right? So, he kills her, she calls upon the Furies, the Furies chase after him. In the play of the Humanities, it's all about 
justice, okay, all three plagues are about the transformation of justice from one kind of justice to another kind of justice. For example, in this play and in this play, justice is what? It, it's revenge. It is entirely revenge. You kill one of mine, I'm going to kill yours. You kill my father, I'm killing you, etc., etc. This play is about the movement from revenge justice to trial by jury. Aeschylus gives us a, a mythological creation of a jury of your peers. It's where our idea of a jury of your peers ultimately goes back to ancient Greece. Okay, So why is all this necessary? This passage comes from this middle play. Oh, the torment bred in the race. That's talking about Agamemnon's ancestors. The torment bred in the race is how they're killing each other. Okay? The grinding scream of death and the stroke that hits the vein, like slicing the neck. The hemorrhage none can staunch. The grief, the curse, no man can bear. That is, the curse in the blood. We can almost go back to book two, bad blood, rotten to the core. This family is pretty much, yeah, okay? But there is a cure in the house and not outside it, no. Not from others, but from them. Who's the them? These people. They're going to be the ones that will bring about this transformation and the gods. <laughs> it's them and Apollo and Athena. In, in this play, the Furies get transformed from these beings who hunt down and terrorize to fertility goddesses, essentially. They bless the land. They bless reproduction and such. All right? But there's a cure in the house, not outside it, no, not from others, but from them, their bloody strife. We sing to you, dark gods beneath the earth. That's the Furies. Now here, you blissful powers underground. Answer the call, send help. Bless the children. There, the chorus is asking for the gods underground, not the Furies per se, but other gods to help the children. Okay? The next epigraph from William Penn, Pennsylvania, Quaker. Death is but crossing the world as friends do the seas. William Penn knew about crossing the seas because he came from England. All his friends didn't come with him. So friends here, he comes here. When he crosses over, does that mean they automatically die? No, but it's like death because he no longer what? He no longer has contact with them. They live in one another still. I would almost bet that some of you have in your wallets and or purses right now pictures or on this of loved ones. Why? Possibly even loved ones that are dead. Why? Because they're dead and gone, but they're not dead and gone. For they must needs be present that love and live in that which is omnipresent. What is that which is omnipresent? Omnipresent all times. Our experiences, love, God, notice, God is called omnipresent and at the same time eternal. Omnipresent in all times. Eternal means outside time. It's like we're in the twilight zone. Okay? If you remember when I talked in the Tolkien part about Boethius, you know, and I did this thing. Uh, Boethius says, you know, God sees all time, like here, the eternal now. That's the omnipresent idea. 
Okay. In this divine glass, they see face to face. That is a paraphrase, or it is an adaptation of St. Paul in Corinthians. I think it's 1 Corinthians. Now we see but through a glass darkly. That is, here on earth, we see, he says, through a glass. That means like these. Or it can mean like a mirror. Okay? We see darkly. Our lenses are dirty. But then, he's talking about after the resurrection, we will see not through a glass, like this dirty glass, but we will see face to face. And he goes on and says, and we will know as we are known. Here, in this divine glass, they see face to face, and their converse is free as well as pure. What's the divine glass that he's talking about? What is this thing that is omnipresent? I think it's this. <laughs> Just love, generally. This is the comfort of friends, that though they may be said to die, yet their friendship and society are, in the best sense, ever present. Why? Because immortal. So we have a new term to include up here. Im. Mortal, not mortal. Mortal means capable of death. The M removes the capability of dying. Okay. After that, you don't necessarily expect to have the first thing you see be Lord fly from death. And I was thinking about this the other day, how the name Voldemort or Voldemort, if you want to be all French, how the Volga, you know, before I div divided those up and said, this comes from the Latin volare, meaning to fly. This means out of or away. And this is obviously death. This could also come from, or excuse me, the whole thing could come from Italian Volta, which means to turn, to turn from death, to turn away from it, okay? Similar meaning, but different kind of derivation. Either way, Voldemort's name still means what? There's death, I'm going this way. <laughs> Dark Lord ascending. So what do we see? We see Snape and Yaxley. Walking down the path towards Malfoy Manor. Okay. Notice we don't begin number four, Primit Drive. Why? The spell's almost gone. The protection is nearly done. So, book four, we start somewhere else. Book five, we go back to Number four, book six, we don't start there. Book seven, we don't start there. And we see them go into the hall. And where does Voldemort place Snape? Right next to him where? On his right side. Why? This is around, I don't know, uh, page three or so, two or three. Why does he put Snape on his right, and where does he put Yaxley? We're told Yaxley's next to Dolohoff. We don't know where Dolohoff is. He's somewhere on the table, probably down there. Okay. Snape goes here. Why? He's the right-hand man. That right-hand man always means what? The closest one to me. Biblically speaking, which by saying biblically, what I mean is biblically and then throughout Western literature, okay, the right side is the side of authority, power, favor, judgment, glory, honor, dominion unto ages of ages, you know, hallelujah kind of a thing. In the Old Testament, when God acts in, in the... Hebrew writers write about it. 
God acts from his right hand. It's the right hand of power. It's the right hand of judgment. It's the right hand of glory. When in the New Testament, the book of Acts, when St. Stephen is being stoned to death and he sees heaven open up, he says, I see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of glory. Christ says, you will see the Son of Man descend from the right hand of the power of God. No. That's the same book. Go back to the beginning of the previous book. Who is doubting Snape? Bellatrix. She's like, you pulled a fast one over the dark door. He goes, really? You think maybe I should tell him that? Maybe you should, maybe I should tell him that you think I'm more powerful than he is. No, 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 no. Okay. What's another reason for Snape being there? He killed Dumbledore, man. He did it. Notice who didn't kill Dumbledore. Who was supposed to? Draco. Okay. And we got that. We didn't talk about it. Life. But we got that whole, you know, Dumbledore talks with him and Draco, you know, I know what you've been trying to do and you couldn't do it. You're not a murderer, blah, blah, blah. All throughout. Okay? So they talk about the ministry and they talk about their plans. Yaxley's telling them, you know, about Dolish and how Dolish thinks, you know, what's going to happen and such. And we finally get down to <coughs> Yaxley talking about putting pious thickness under an imperious curse. Okay, so who's pious thickness? Notice the name, by the way. What does pious mean? If you describe somebody as being pious, what are they? Devout, holy, spiritual. Okay? Really, a true believer in their, you know, religious system. It's, usually it's only used to describe a religious adherent. You don't say, you know, Nancy Pelosi is really pious for the Democratic Party. No. Is she a true believer in the Democratic Party? Yes, she is. Probably nobody is more true a believer than Nancy Pelosi. But you don't use that language about politics or sports or anything other than religious belief. But it's pious thickness. Thickness implies what? You're raising your eyebrows. Slow, dense. He's kind of thick. He's not real fast on the uptake. Okay? So he's now under a period curse. He's the head of magical law enforcement. Right? Voldemort, that's a start. That's good. That's good. But thickness is only one man. Scrimger must be surrounded by our people before I act. Notice who's the goal? Scrimger. He's got to be surrounded. Why? We've got to take him out. Notice he has to be surrounded. What's that telling us about Rufus Scrimger? In the mind of Voldemort. He's dangerous. This is respect. He's powerful. Okay? Scrimger is not a flake. Yeah, he kind of meddles maybe in some business he shouldn't. Harry and Dumbledore. But ultimately, what side is he on? He's on the right side. Okay? So, that actually goes on. Yes, my lord, you're right. But as you know, as head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, Thickness has regular contact, not only with the minister himself, but also with the heads of all other ministry departments. Okay? It will, I think... Be easy, now that we have such a high-ranking official under our control, to subjugate the others. And notice, by the way, he's the head of magical law enforcement, and yet he cannot do what? That Harry can do. Fight an imperious curse. Okay. Maybe Harry can't really fight an imperious curse, right? Maybe the false man I moody wasn't really putting him under an imperious curse. No. Why not? 
as Voldemort attempts to put him under an imperial curse, and he throws it off. Okay? So, they keep talking. Voldemort. As long as our friend Thickness is not discovered before he has, and look at the language that he uses. When you think of pious as only being related to religion, John, uh, Voldemort says, until he has converted the rest. I'm a politics junkie. I mean, I shoot it up like every morning. After morning prayers, I get on my blogs, you know, all that kind of stuff. Anyways, a Democrat, South Texas, Del Rio, I think it was, the other day, state Democrat, not national, switched parties. He said, I'm, I'm becoming a Republican. He switched parties. He didn't convert. This terminology is like pious, only used for religion. You don't convert from capitalism to Marxism or Marxism to capitalism. You convert to from Christianity to Buddhism or from Judaism to Islam, but you don't convert from the Republican Party to the Democrat or vice versa, not you know favoring one or the other. It's only used in religious terms. So what's Voldemort saying? It's almost like we have Voldemortism, and I don't know what's the opposite going to be. Dumbledoreism. Here's your two belief systems, or Potterism. I, we're going to get this kind of language. I'll, there's going to be loaded religious language throughout this book, okay? Which, do I have time to make this little aside? Yeah, I do. Which is one of the reasons why, when this book was first published in 2007, Rowling did an interview before it was actually published with a writer for the New York Times. I'm trying to remember the guy's name. The guy's a writer, a, a fiction writer himself. He writes fantasy of sorts, and his name is escaping me. Um, but he did an interview that came out almost immediately after the book was published. And he was like, you know, the headline of, of uh, one of his articles was, Who Dies in Harry Potter Saddle? God. And he makes this argument that Rowling kills God, essentially, because in his understanding, God is absent. And so he does this interview, and Rowling's like, he's not as absent as you seem to think he is. He's like, what do you mean? Where, where is he? Why isn't God there? And she's kind of like, maybe you need to reread it. Okay, this guy's a book critic, and he misses some of the Big, big stuff in the book. And I don't mean he misses simply this. Because we hear that about six or seven times throughout the books. We heard it for the first time in the previous book. Okay? So, let's go on. What do we see happen in the Dark Lord Ascending? Other than this little conversation, other than, you know, Voldemort pointing out that Malfoys don't appear to be too happy to have Malfoy Manor, just as number 12 Grimald Street is the headquarters of Order of Phoenix, Malfoy Manor, Malfoy, bad faith, Manor is the headquarters of Voldemortism. <laughs> we see, again, Snape at, Dun at Voldemort's right hand Charity Burbage, kind of revolving up in the air above. Severus, please, please, Avada Kedavra. He doesn't lift a finger to stop her from dying. Okay? And we get a description, by the way, as that happens, 
of Draco. And how does Draco look? Not too happy. In memoriam, chapter 2. Shoot, we're not going to have time to do what I want to do. Harry was bleeding. Wait, how many days do we have? Uh, five million probably like this. Um, Harry was bleeding, clutching his right hand in his left, swearing under his breath. He shouldered open his bedroom door. There was a crunch of breaking china. He had trodden on a cup of cold tea that had been sitting on the floor outside his bedroom door. Okay. Wait a second. Why is this hand? I'm thinking order of events here in terms of how this is portrayed. Why is his right hand bleeding? Notice Harry was bleeding, clutching his right hand and his left, swearing under his breath. He shouldered open his bedroom door. There is a crunch of breaking china. Is the crunch of breaking china after he shoulders open his door? Open seems to imply he's going out from his room into the hallway. Yes, I knew I ran that. I misspoke when I did my class the other day. His hand is bleeding from what? Is it the broken china on the floor? Does he step on it, break it, try to pick it up and cut his hand? No. His hand is cut from the mirror. Okay? That Sirius gave him, it's broken. It's got a, you know, he picks it up, he cuts himself. He goes to step outside, he pushes the door open with his shoulder and steps on the china and breaks it. Okay. He trod on a cup of cold tea that had been sitting on the floor outside. His and what the? And he thinks it was Dudley's idea of a clever booby trap. I wish what she had done, rolling, is that leaving his hand bleeding is fine because it's symbolic, by the way. It's foreshadowing. Just as we had foreshadowing in the first in the in the previous book, what does Harry see with Dumbledore's hand when he first sees him? It's withered, right? Why? Is it because of the duel he had with Voldemort at the end of the previous book? That's what Snape says it is. No, it's because of the ring. Okay, so. Harry's hand is going to be injured because that's his wand hand and something's going to happen later on. I wish when she had him step out that she had him step on the china, crack it, and cut his heel. Anybody know why? Why would it be symbolically really cool for Harry to cut his heel? Because there's a Biblical prophecy, it's taken. Let me rephrase that. There's a passage in Genesis that's taken to be prophecy. It's taken to be messianic prophecy. Where in the curse, God tells Adam and Eve, you will bruise his head and he will bruise your heel. The bruising the head will be the Messiah stomping on the head of Satan and Satan will bruise the heel of the Messiah. Okay? Nail through the heel, that kind of thing. So, why sh in my version, why would it be cool for Rowling to do that? Because of the metaphor. What is Harry? Yeah, he's the chosen one. He's the anointed one. Chosen and anointed by whom? Voldemort. Not God, so to speak. So, he goes back in, bandages up his hand, and we see the article by Elphias Doge. Okay? We first met, no, take that back. That was 
and it was too cold. Um, read all that. You get to the end of it, and we're told. Second paragraph after the, the passage. He had thought he knew Dumbledore quite well, but ever since <coughs> reading this obituary, he'd been forced to recognize he had barely known him at all. Never once had he imagined Dumbledore's childhood or youth. It was as though he had sprung into being as Harry had known him. Venerable and silver-haired and old. Why is that appropriate? That is, why is it appropriate for Harry to think or act as though Dumbledore had sprung into being as Harry had known him? Because for Harry, that's exactly how it was. How did Harry first experience, first see Dumbledore? Like this. Why is it inappropriate for Harry to even kind of have thought about the younger Dumbledore? Well, we know he's seen the younger, younger Dumbledore, right? In the pensive, he saw Dumbledore with auburn hair, for example. Way, way back, okay? What else? He knew from his very first trip on the Hogwarts Express, Dumbledore, because he got a chocolate frog card, that was a Dumbledore card, Dumbledore was responsible for what? The defeat of Grindelwald in 1945. What else was he responsible for? The discovery of the use of dragon's heartstring or dragon's blood. His work with Nicholas Flamel on the Philosopher's Stone. Okay. But here we're told Harry never thought about the younger Dumbledore. But at least, top of the next page, or possibly same page, Harry realizes it would be impertinent, okay? It would have felt strange and pertinent even. To do what? To ask Dumbledore about his past. What would that be akin to in our world? It'd be like one of you walking down to President McPhee's office, knocking on the door, and then just barging right on in, sitting down and going, so Sid, tell me about your youth. Okay, there's not 130 years difference in age between you and Dr. McPhee as there is at least with Harry and Dumbledore. What else? Dr. McPhee hasn't defeated the most powerful evils in the world, etc. Okay? But that's the analogy. It wouldn't be right. What do you think Dumbledore would, well, Dumbledore would say, what do you want to know, Harry? I'll tell you everything. I'm an open book. To some extent. So, we get the little snippet about Rita Skeeter. Harry opens the paper, and he rereads the whole thing. He reaches the bottom of the article, so after the article... He stares blankly at the page. Revulsion and fury rose in him like vomit. He balls up the paper and throws it in the corner. Why revulsion and fury? The only other time we're told that Harry has those kinds of feelings in relation to something about Dumbledore <coughs> is when or where. Louder? Okay. Where else? Book five. When Dumbledore is just getting ready for them to touch the port key, and Harry and Dumbledore's faces are like this far apart, and Harry looks up and sees those serene blue eyes, and he wants what? He wants to bite them. And we're told, I think the word fury is used there, one of those two. Same kind of thing. Is the revulsion and fury at Dumbledore, though? Mm, a little bit. Okay. He sits down, he picks up the mirror, and he sees a flash of blue. And it's the same flash of blue he saw in Dumbledore's eyes. What do you like? He's dead. <laughs> nope. He's, he's not somewhere where this mirror can communicate with him. Okay. 
I wanted to get farther. We'll pick up with the Dursley's Departing. Pretty important chapter because there's a scene in it that's not included in the theatrical release of the film. It's a really, really, really important scene that's related to the scene at the end of the book that also is not in the theatrical release of the film. 